The introduction of computer systems like the Commodore 64 and Apple II gave amateur designers the foundation they needed to shape the future of video games. One of the most legendary game designers is John Romero. A friend of mine and my brother came home one day during the summer. Oh my god, there's games that you can play for free up at the college. And, uh, and I was like, no way. We immediately got on our bikes, went back up to college, went into the computer lab, and uh, and they basically started showing me these games, which were pretty lame. You know, it was like Poison Cookie and Hunt the Wumpus and like really old games, basically printing the screen on paper, you know, and make the next move and print the next screen. It was pretty lame. And as soon as I saw that, I knew that I had to make games. Back then, you had to use your imagination. The graphics were so crappy, but you made it cool. It was the coolest thing. There was so much left to be desired that my imagination just did amazing things with the game. I got a job at, at Softdisk. I basically couldn't take it anymore. I wasn't making games, and that's what I had to do. So I told the president of the company, um, I'm gonna, I, I, I have to make games or I gotta go. I uh, started a new division of the company. I just kind of walked in there, was like, who'd be cool to work with? <laughs> that long-haired guy is pretty cool looking. I had seen a person named John Carmack's uh, games, and I got those guys, I was like, hey, we're making games together right now, it's doing really well. Let's do some stuff at night on the side, make some other games for this other company. And they're like, okay. And that's how we started it. We got our first check and it was like, uh, it's time to go. <laughs> so we totally, like, you know, we quit. So we started coming up with ideas for what would be our next game that's a 3D texture map game. Hey. How about Wolfenstein, Castle Wolfenstein? Let's do a 3D version of Castle Wolfenstein. The one game that really caught my attention was uh, Wolfenstein 3D. And called it Wolfenstein 3D. Forget the castle thing, it's not so cool sounding. Basically released it and the world was like went insane. That same year, it began development of a new game called Doom. It used programming John Carmack had been working on that was faster and more complex than anything else that had ever been done it would change the world. You know, we always had a humor, so we thought it'd be a great idea to take some of the humor, mix religion with it, take aliens and kind of put it together. A space Marine against hell demons. We were like watching Evil Dead, and it was like super funny. Shotguns and chainsaws, ancient, you know, the future tech, religious kind of hell stuff in, in the future on in space. Let's do that, that's awesome. We put a press release out in January of 1993, basically stating what was going to be in this game, and we just barely started making it. That got out there, and we had a lot to live up to. <laughs> you know, we got the game done in one year, and released on December 10th of 93, and, and uh, you know, we thought Wolfenstein was insane. It was like, you know, off the charts for Doom. So it was like single player, co-op, deathmatch, you know, multiplayer on a LAN over a modem, and guess what, you can make your own levels and everything was insane. You know, we could see the future of this game is so hardcore, I mean, it was so fast, it was so brutal, it sounds great, um, you know, it's like a sport. For the first time we had a competitive side to the game. It wasn't just like man versus computer, it was man versus man. And all we did was play Doom. A few years later, Doom 2 was released, and I spent every evening for probably two years playing that game. At the peak of my addiction to Doom 2, you know, I'd run about a thousand dollar a month phone bill because we played games over a modem, right? We didn't have the internet. Doom 2 changed the world. Released the following year, Doom 2 sold a million and a half copies. The ability to compete against another player gave birth to a hardcore gaming scene where gamers devoted themselves to becoming the best. You know, that was basically the start of what would be, you know, competitive gaming. It was you know, four or five of your buddies sitting around talking trash, yelling at each other. There weren't any rules. You were just playing to get bragging rights. Who got the most frags? There wasn't big money involved. There weren't organized leagues. It wasn't very long after uh, Doom's release. It was during 1994 when um, tournaments started happening. When I won a national championship in Doom 2, I won a copy of Windows and two liters of Coke. Which, by the way, was an amazing prize back then. There was a, a tournament called the Red Annihilation Tournament that was held at E3, and uh, and John Carmack basically put up his his uh, his first Ferrari. It was a red 328 that was turboed and everything. Um, he put that up as a prize, 
And so the first the first winner of the first like huge tournament with an awesome Ferrari and stuff was Dennis Fong, who's called Thresh. And um, you know, that was the beginning of like, wow, you can win things that mean something in by playing games.